Hello and welcome. I'm excited about this video because at the end of it, if you follow along, you will end up with this program, your very own Raycaster. And if you don't know how to program but still want to watch the video, you will end up with this, which is also pretty cool. The first game to really make a Raycaster engine popular was called Wolfenstein 3D back in 1992, which at the time looked unbelievable that you could do this much on such slow computers at that time. There are several limitations to a Raycaster engine, but you'll get to see how easy it is to create the actual code to write the game, and how quickly it is to update an actual level. People are still making their very own creative games today, and I've been wanting to share that with you and how you can create your own, and maybe you'll end up making a really fun game that people love to play. This may sound crazy, but what you're looking at is actually a top-down two-dimensional game, but we are going to convert that into what looks like a 3D game. But before we begin, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, the uh, only sponsor I could get, water. The perfect combination of hydrogen and oxygen. Scientists recommended for the creation of life, doctor recommended if you want to stay alive. Powerful hydration, clocked in at zero calories, gluten-free, so the choice is clear, clear as water, water. Make the fun times even more fun. Promotional codes and link below. Thanks again. Water. <clears throat> okay. What we are about to create, you can imagine as a world made from perfectly square cubes, and we have a player in this world, but he is unable to see anything. But he can cast a ray from his eyes forward until it hits one of these walls, and then we can convert that ray distance into a vertical line. And when you do this enough times, you are able to now see the world you're in. And what makes this technique so optimized is how few checks you actually have to do per ray to detect a wall. We will first use triangles on the horizontal grid lines, we'll save that distance, and do the same on the vertical lines. We'll compare both and whichever hit closest we'll use as the vertical line strip. And that's how we're going to convert this 2D world into a quote-unquote 3D world. I'm going to write this code in C and use OpenGL to draw the graphics to the screen, but you can convert this to any other program that you want. OpenGL is already on almost every graphics card out there, so the game that you make can be sent and played by almost anyone. You can follow my video where I walk you through each step to install Dev C++ and OpenGL for free. And we will use this program as a starting point. I'm going to clean and remove a few things. I'm going to set the background to a dark gray. I'm going to set the new window dimension to 1024 by 512 pixels. And I'm going to call this function in the main function. And we'll add the standard C header files. And I'm going to save this as a normal C file. I'm going to compile and run. And there it is, our amazing gray window. Now let's add a player. We'll give x and y position variables and a function to draw that player. With the red and green values both set to 1, that'll give us a yellow color. Let's call this function in our display function. And we can initialize a player's position in here. And there he is, but we're going to want to make him move. We'll create a function with these OpenGL parameters to check if a key has been pressed. We'll check if W, A, D, or S has been pressed, and we'll move the X or Y position in the positive or negative direction. And we'll need to reference this function in the keyboard function in the main loop. And there he goes, we can now finally move our player. He looks pretty lonely, so let's give him a world to move around in. Let's create our own world. That world's going to be a grid of 8x8 eight eight units, and each of these cubes is going to be 64 units in size. The level itself is going to be stored in a single array, but I'll add some spaces so you can clearly see it. Zero is going to represent empty spaces, and a one is going to be where the wall is. We don't want this player just walking off anywhere, so let's lock this place down. Add a few walls here and here and maybe one here. And the function to draw this map will be two for loops going through the x's and the y values and offset by 64, our cube size. These walls will have a color of white and empty spaces will be black. We need to call this function before we draw our player. And let's compile and run. This is correct, but it could look a little better. 
I'm going to add or subtract one pixel so it'll outline each of the cubes. Yay, our player finally has his own place to live. He can go here, or maybe here. He can explore over here, or maybe go over here. And this is good, but just to warn you, our next step is going to involve some math. But, but don't go, don't go. Stay here. I'll walk you through it. So we want to rotate the player, which means we'll have to use sine and cosine and the value of pi. Let's add the math.h header file, and we'll save the value of pi. We now need to store the delta x and delta y and angle of the player. So now when we look left, we'll have to subtract a small amount from that player's angle. A small amount because in C, the sine and cosine will use radian values. So instead of 0 to 360 degrees, it's 0 to 2 pi, which is around a 6.28 value. If we go less than 0, let's reset back to 2 pi. The values returned from sine and cosine are very small, so let's multiply that by 5. And looking right, we add that small value. And if we go above 2 pi, let's reset back to 0. Moving forward and backward is very simple, since we just add that delta x and delta y. It would be pretty cool if we could see this direction, so let's go ahead and draw that. And let's calculate that delta x and delta y when the program first runs. And look at that. You can now look at stuff. Look at him looking around. Looks like we made progress. I'll probably cut that joke out. It's not really a joke. Everything up to this point has been set up, so now we can actually start casting rays. Here are the variables we will need for this function. First we have to hold and set the rays angle to the player's angle. And let's just take things slow and cast one ray for now. We will need the negative inverse of tangent, so that'll be negative 1 divided by tangent. So first up, we're going to check the horizontal grid lines. Let's find the x and y value where the ray will first hit the closest horizontal line. We first need to know if the ray is looking up or down. And we know this by looking at the ray's angle. If it's less than pi, aka 180 degrees, then our ray is facing upwards. We want to round the ray's y position to the nearest 64th value, and a cool way to do that and impress your friends is to simply divide the value by 64 by bit shifting at 6 down, then multiplying it by 64 or bit shifting at 6 up, and subtract a small amount for accuracy. The ray's x value is the distance between the player and the ray's y position, times the inverse of tangent, plus we gotta add that player's x position. And once we find out the ray's first hit position, we need the next x and y offset. So the y offset we will subtract 64 units, and the x offset is the y offset value times the inverse of tangent. Now if the ray is looking down, then the values are exactly the same, but, but a little different. So yeah, it's not exactly the same. Just change here where we add 64, and here is a positive y offset. If the ray is looking straight left or right, it's impossible for the ray to ever hit a horizontal line. And we don't want to check forever and get caught in a loop, so I'll add a depth of field to check to 8 max. So we know the large coordinates where the ray will hit the wall, but we need to know where that is in the map array. Let's take the ray hit position and divide it by 64, and set that to find the position in the map's array. If the map position is less than the array size, then we can check it inside the map. And if the value is 1, then there is a wall there. So if we hit a wall, we're done. You can shut this loop down, go to the beach, take a few selfies, run around in the sand, have some fun. You deserve it. And when you come back, let me know, because this is my favorite part. If we didn't hit a wall, all we have to do to check the next horizontal line is add the x and y offset. That's it. Just a simple addition. This is what makes a raycaster so optimized and super fast. And then finally, let's draw this ray, starting from where the player is to where the ray ended. When we compile, it'll look like this. The green ray is actually doing exactly what we told it to do. Check the first horizontal grid line for any walls. If none, then add the x and y offset and check the next horizontal grid line. If there is a wall there, then end the loop and draw the ray. Now don't let me lose you yet. I know this looks intimidating, but let me just show you what we're fighting for your very own game that is easy to make and fun to play. So just hang in there. Next up is the vertical line check. We can put this drawing function on one line and copy and paste the horizontal chunk of code. 
For this check, we only need the negative tangent of the value of the ray angle. We should update that new variable in these places. And since we are checking vertical lines, we need to know now if the ray is facing left or right, or up or down. If we look at the unit circle, we can see that the right side would be less than 90 degrees, pi divided by 2, or greater than 270 degrees, 3 pi divided by 2. Let's define those values so we can use them later. And be sure to use the OR symbol here. And no, I did not spend like 40 minutes trying to figure out why it wasn't working with the AND symbol. It just, it needs to be OR. Which makes sense if you look at the unit circle. Anyways, since this is now the vertical line check, it's flipped so all X's now become Y's and all Y's now become X's. It's like opposite world. And that's the only change we really need to make. But we can draw this ray with a different color. Let's make it red. And compile and run. And it's working correctly. The ray is casted out forward and stops when it hits a vertical line with a solid wall. And this is the heart of the code. Let me show you both rays at once. You can see where the green ray stops on the horizontal walls and the red stops on the vertical. All we need to do now is only use and draw the shortest line that hits first. Before we continue, I notice that we're currently checking if the map value is less than the array size, but we should also make sure that it's above zero too. Okay, that's better. We need a function that will return the distance between the player and the ray's endpoint. That's the hypotenuse, so we can use the Pythagorean theorem. Remember that we are looking for the shortest distance, so let's make the default value really high. And we will be saving the horizontal ray's x and y position. And the vertical is the same, but with the v in the variable name. And we don't need to draw this anymore. And now, if we hit a wall, and after we go to the beach, not fun, and come back, we should save the ray's x and y position and calculate the ray's distance from the player. Same for the vertical, but with the correct variable name. And we want the shortest distance, so if the vertical or horizontal is shorter, then we set the ray to that variable. And check that out, isn't that cool? The ray now stops when it hits any side of the wall. And this kind of looks like its own game to me. It reminds me of Spider-Man's web. Next, we'll draw a few more of these rays. We'll want to move the next ray back one degree but since sine and cosine uses radians, let's define that value. If we initialize our ray angle back one degree from our player angle, we should add our limits to the next angle. And let's move back 30 degrees. You can see the ray is back 30 degrees from the player's angle. Now let's increase the for loop to draw 10 rays. And after each ray is done, we should increase the ray by one degree and set the limit again. So far so good, and no errors, so let's cast 60 rays, which will be 30 degrees to the left and right of the player. We've done it, and the rays are working correctly. And hey, just for fun, let me show you something cool. You don't have to do this part, but let me show you what all 360 rays looks like at once. Now that's pretty cool. It looks like a light source, shining light and casting shadows. But this is not necessary for this, so let's go back to 60 rays. That's better. We forgot to create a variable to hold the final distance, and by we, I mean, um, Leo. So let's set the new variable to the distance right here. Now we are ready to draw the 3D scene. My window will be 320 by 160 pixels. So the formula for each line height will be our cube size times our new screen height divided by that ray distance. So the further away, the larger the distance, the shorter the final line height will be. And let's cap the line at 320. No taller. I'm going to use OpenGL to draw the line every 8th pixel, and shift the window over to the right side. You can see the line heights are correct, but we need each line to be offset to the center of the screen. So the offset is just the full window height, minus half the line height. You would think it would be correct, but do you see the warping? This problem happens in all raycasters. The fisheye effect actually makes sense because the further rays are a longer distance than the center rays, but they need to be equal. This is easy to fix with ma cosine. We need to find the distance between the player angle and the ray angle. Make limits, of course. 
and multiply the ray distance by cosine of that new angle. And now we have it, a 2D top-down level that we can reformat into a quote-unquote 3D level. But wait, there's more. In a normal 3D engine, lighting can be a very difficult and complicated task for programmers. But not for a raycaster. Remember that we know if the ray hit a vertical or horizontal side. So we can set each to different colors, and that will be a simple form of lighting and shading. It's amazing how simple lighting in a raycaster can be. But wait, there's more! It's easy to change the level layout of the walls by simply updating the array. But wait, there's even more! We can hold on to that array number and change the wall properties like have different colors or even wall heights. There is so much we can do with so little lines of code, and that's why I find Arraycaster so interesting and I really wanted to share it with you. I can even optimize this even more and port it to my Game Boy Advance. This is running on the real hardware, and I want to make a video tutorial to show you how you can program your own games on the Game Boy Advance. You can check out my other videos where I program Minecraft or Zelda for the Game Boy Advance. And leave your thoughts in the comments on this video, or if you have any suggestions on future videos. And if you like this, we can do a part 2 where we add actual textures to the walls, maybe floors and ceilings, sprites, collision, enemies, so much more we can add. Thank you for watching it this far, I hope you learned something or at least enjoyed the video, and as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>